Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the ASSR 2021 Gold Medal Ceremony. I'm Dr. Michelle Johnson, uh, first past president of the society, and it's been a wonderful symposium so far. I hope you will enjoy the conversation and join me in congratulating our honoree for today. Let me share my screen. The ASSR 2021 gold medal is a very important activity of the society. The gold medal was established in 2012 and it's awarded annually to a member who has provided dedicated service to the ASSR and to the science and education of spine radiology. ASSR gold medal recipients in the past, John Mathis, Robert Quenser, Ken Camerata, Alan Williams, Wade Wong, Victor Houghton, Judy Donovan Post, and Jeffrey Ross. And today we have the honor of awarding the gold medal to Gordon Zay, MD, our 2021 gold medal winner. You all know Gordon from many uh, meetings you've gone to where he's spoken, teaching articles, mentor along the way. But let's see if we can get to know him a little bit better in the next few minutes and then you'll get to hear from Gordon himself. How did he get here? Dr. Zay graduated from Phillips Academy, followed by Harvard College with summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa, so we know he's smart. After a Sheldon Fellowship, which you'll hear about a little bit later, he went to study rural health care delivery in developing countries and subsequently earned his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. He crossed the country to do internship, residency, and fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco, and then recrossed the country back to his native Manhattan to be an assistant professor at Cornell Medical School and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Finally, his final move was to Yale University School of Medicine, where he has served as chief of neuroradiology for 30 years. This is a picture from the time he spent uh, on his Sheldon Fellowship and I thought was a good example of how did he get here as he's in the long boat. For ASSR service, Dr. Zay has had a long history. He started in the early 90s serving on many committees and executive roles over the years and culminating in his presidency of the ASSR from 2004 to 2005. He has also served the ASSR through his activities in the ASNR and other organizations in radiology, both nationally and internationally. He served as the president of the ASNR from 2014 to 2015 and is a trustee of the foundation of the American Society of Neuroradiology. In 2004, Dr. Robert Quenser another gold medal winner of the ASSR wrote this lovely uh, biography of the 10th president of the American Society of Spine Radiology. I commend that to your attention. For the 2020 annual symposium, you can see Dr. Zay participated in the past president SAM exercises where the past presidents seen here at the bottom of the slide brought their best educational cases to the group. And here, uh, Dr. Zay with the Yale Neuroradiology and Yale Neurosurgery contingent of the faculty at that meeting. Dr. Zay's research activities uh, fit into three categories and they're fairly broad. And I would start with MRI where he has looked at exploring techniques uh, and their utility and contrast agents. Um, pediatric neuroradiology of the brain and spine, where his focus has been on the quality of image acquisition and interpretation, particularly in the neonatal period. And then more recently, he's again at cutting edge of technology 
working with the neonatal MRI and the portable MRI in the neurocritical care and emergency room environment, he literally brings neuroradiology expertise to the bedside. But when he's not practicing neuroradiology, he collects African and Oceanic art. This article talks about his uh, museum quality collection of Melanesian and Polynesian art and how his uncle architect I.M. Pei influenced the way he displays that art. And here is uh, again, reminiscent of something else he carried back from his fellowship and experience to explore the art of these uh, people in uh, these areas of Asia. And you can see him in his apartment and with his Asian art displayed. This piece in his collection is a Hawaiian feather cape. It's composed of feathers from now extinct birds. This is a promised gift to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in honor of their 150th anniversary. So when he's not practicing neuroradiology and collecting Asian art, Dr. Zay loves to fish. And here he is with a 40 pound striped bass that he caught surf casting locally. So there is time for things outside of neuroradiology that keeps you fresh. For education, it goes without saying that Dr. Zay is an excellent teacher and is a sought after speaker. He has modeled excellence in neuroradiology and has trained and mentored fellows and junior faculty as section chief of neuroradiology at Yale for 30 years. Gordon has inspired many medical students, residents and fellows and has mentored and sponsored many to join and participate in the ASSR through his teaching and research. Many trainees, colleagues, and friends are here in spirit to wish Dr. Zay congratulations. And these are a number of pictures over the years of many colleagues, trainees, and friends that uh, have been at Yale. And so I wish a hearty congratulations on behalf of President Dan Nguyen and the ASSR. I am proud to present my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Gordon Zay with the ASSR 2021 gold medal. All of us wish you all the best as you look at the people whose lives you've touched, whose education you've enhanced. Congratulations, Gordon Zay. First, let me deeply thank the awards committee of the ASSR for considering me. When I look back at the prior recipients of the gold medal, I am humbled. And when I look back at the accomplishments of the past presidents, I'm also humbled to be in their company. And of course, I would like to thank all the members of the ASSR, many of whom I've worked with for years. I'm gonna keep this short as befits a talk at a virtual symposium so that everyone doesn't click onto something else. My road to medicine was never a question. Having a father as a physician, in my case, a chest surgeon, tends to do that to young children. But my road into radiology was not so clear. In fact, as Michelle has indicated, I had a fellowship after college to study healthcare delivery in developing countries, which took me to New Guinea, Nepal, and Rwanda. Here we are giving a talk on basic healthcare measures to the villagers in New Guinea, actually in the same region as where Dr. Gatacek did his Nobel Prize winning work on Kuru, a disease transmitted through consuming the brains of others who have died of the disease and the original disease which led to the discovery of prion. When I returned to the US for medical school, international health was high on my list. It's hard to think, to think of a field more different from radiology than international health. The principle of international health is to serve as many as you can with limited resources. An MR scanner is totally unwise when that same amount of money can be used to vaccinate the entire pediatric population of some countries. But I fell into radiology due to example. 
Radiology was a popular elective when I was in medical school and the radiologists were great mentors. And after doing a residency in radiology, neuroradiology wasn't exactly clear to me. Again, I fell into neuroradiology almost by chance. There were certainly other fields of radiology that were equally attractive, but again, mentorship played a role. I happened to do a project with Mike Ransowatsky that was successful, resulting in my first paper, an MR histology correlation describing the normal small foci of hyperintense signal at the corners of the lateral ventricles and relating it to normal microscopic structures of the brain. And so I did a fellowship in neuroradiology. But if my first paper had been in, let's say, the liver, I probably would have ended up as a body radiologist. So I look back now after several decades, realizing how many of my career pathways, like life, were by chance. After finishing my residency in UCSF, I came back east and was attending at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Again, it was a little by chance. I had a friend from UCSF who had taken a position at Sloan Kettering and she called me, so it sort of fell into my lap. Again, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. UCSF had the first clinical MR scanner in the world and residents and fellows who had any MR experience were valued commodities even though MR imaging was still at a very basic stage. I remember in those days, we would have patients from the entire country come to have MR scans of their spine at UCSF for suspected core diseases, such as MS. I remember how often, not only could we not comment on the spinal cord, in some cases, with our thick slices and poor quality scans, we couldn't even see the spinal cord. And so I came to Sloan Kettering at a time when surface coils for spinal imaging were just being developed. And again, I was in the right place at the right time. I was in a place where there was a huge concentration of a specific pathology, metastases in various forms to the spine, just when surface coil technology was being developed. And I had also had some training in doing some of the early phase two and phase three cases for gadolinium of the brain at UCSF. Clearly, applying gadolinium to the spine was a natural, and I was able to take on the role of lead investigator in these clinical trials. What developed and what we found may seem basic nowadays, but you have to think back. Contrast was not that helpful in CT scanning of the spine, and it actually wasn't clear how helpful gadolinium would be. I vividly remember one of the first patients we did, shown here, who had left a meningeal tumor in the spine. When I saw those first images coming out in the darkened console room, showing brightly enhancing leptomeningeal nodules coating the nerve roots, something we had never been able to see before, it was a eureka moment. I knew then that this was a real moment of revelation. And I remember presenting those cases at ASNR and showing the non-contrast images, as you can see on the left, and the contrast enhanced images on the right for comparison at the silver anniversary 25th annual meeting of the ASNR in New York City before most of the neuroradiologists in the country. Because in those days, there were no concurrent sessions and everything was in one big room. It's amusing to me that nowadays, residents in their first month rotating on neuro-MR see gadolinium enhancement of small structures in the spine and think of it as routine. But in these early days, it was a big deal. And I continued to do work on other interesting spine projects. Diffusion and tractography in the spine as one of the primary beta sites. And the senior author of the updated nomenclature of the lumbar spine. However, the spine and the spinal cord are difficult structures with which to work. The bony vertebrae create significant susceptibility artifacts. The spinal cord itself is small, surrounded by the bony spine and also affected by movement artifacts from blood flow, CSF flow, respiration, swallowing, et cetera. Some other potentially promising avenues of research, such as functional imaging, perfusion, volumetrics, and spectroscopy have been difficult to implement in the spine and have not received nearly the widespread everyday use that they have in the brain. However, at this point, I think we stand on the verge of a new major development, namely, the application of AI and deep learning to the spine. The capability of AI to detect fractures will revolutionize spinal imaging. 
Here's a trauma case we had recently. And of course, you all know that this is just one image out of hundreds. No longer will residents, fellows, radiologists, and yes, radiologists, even neuroradiologists specializing in, spine, specializing in spine, agonize over the case of the elderly patient who just fell and whose CT scans showed diffuse proliferative osteophytes. Here's the same patient with AI automatically highlighting the fracture in red. However, the capabilities of AI will go beyond just diagnosis. AI can be utilized in the entire panoply of imaging issues, from appropriate scheduling and protocoling, to reading through the EMR for relevant clinical information, to image acquisition, to image interpretation, to automated quantitative analysis, to communication of results. This is a paradigm shift on the order of the evolution of imaging from plain films to cross-sectional techniques or on the order of the advent of MR imaging. This will be a prime role for the ASSR and the ASNR to foster. So in a way, I look at today's honor as having come a full circle in neuroradiology from one paradigm shift, the move from CT and X-ray based techniques to MR and now another paradigm shift, the increasing implementation of AI and deep learning. This is truly an exciting time to be in neuroradiology, and I am so happy to be able to continue on this great voyage with all of you. Thank you very much. Gordon, that was a wonderful talk that you've shared with us your, your life, and your vision and your thoughts for the future in neuroradiology. We collectively from the ASSR family wish you well and thank you for all of your contributions to our society.